So I, I'd like to talk about uh, complications after radical prostatectomy and surgical treatment of incontinence. These are my disclosures. Radical prostatectomy does involve removing the whole prostate, part or all of the seminal vesicles, uh, and anastomosing the uh, bladder neck to the urethra, uh, hopefully leaving in as much as muscle control and nerves uh, and structures around there as possible. Uh, looking at uh, data as far as um, new cases of prostate cancer in Canada, there were 24,000 new cases of prostate cancer in 2015. And uh, there were about 7,262 uh, radical prostatectomies. The number of radical prostatectomies is gradually falling over the years because of the onset of active surveillance as a treatment modality. Post-radical prostatectomy incontinence can occur anywhere from 1 to 40% of the time, depending on how you define it and what you use to measure it. But approximately 5 to 25% of people will experience incontinence that fails to improve with conservative management and a substantial minority will ultimately undergo surgical treatment. In looking at uh, cases of, 20, uh, of radical prostatectomy, 25,346 men between 1993 and 2006 in the province of Ontario, 5% over time underwent surgery for urinary incontinence. That includes mostly artificial sphincter, but some slings. As was mentioned before, the pathophysiology can be bladder and sphincter, but it's mostly uh, sphincter dysfunction. Other uh, components may play a, uh, play a role, such as urethral length intraoperatively, and of course we know pelvic floor status, both preoperative and postoperative, is important. Investigations are fairly straightforward. Uh, for urinary incontinence, uh, it's probably agreed upon that if one is intervening for urinary incontinence that we should do cystourethroscopy and imaging if necessary, depending on what's done. As was mentioned before, urodynamics can be helpful but in a number of studies, urodynamics hasn't really helped us in terms of selecting treatment, and it's not correlated with outcome. We have a whole slew of operations that can be done. Retropubic slings have been around for a long time, uh, but by and large, what's happening is a, a transition over time to the transobturator approach. Uh, it was mentioned the male sling was the in-van sling. Uh, there are lots of patients in the literature uh, but the in-van sling has largely been abandoned. It's not done traditionally. What has replaced uh, the approach, uh, as I mentioned, is a transobturator approach. This is the uh, advanced sling, which is uh, supposedly put in retrourethral. It's behind the urethra. The success rate is anywhere from 75 to 90 percent with a follow-up of about two years. But there are complications such as retention, perineal pain, and other things. And occasionally they have to be removed and they do fail over time. A new concept in terms of uh, lengthening the urethra was just published as far as providing a cushion of bulbal, uh, bulbar tissue underneath the urethra so that it may actually become a back, uh, backboard, just like as is accomplished in uh, female incontinence, in addition to elongating the sphincter active length of the urethra. But the advanced sling is not that good after radiation. The success rate goes from about 75 to 80 percent down to about 40 or 50 percent. And this is across many series. So what's the ideal sling patient for incontinence? Well, someone who's not had radiation, no previous surgery for urinary incontinence or no stricture, uh, mild to moderate, that is uh, 200 grams or less. But usually that's difficult to define. Uh, cystoscopy shows no intraurethral uh, problems. And what has been uh, defined is a urethral repositioning test uh, to measure urethral coaptation. The Argus sling has been around for a little while, and what has, modif uh, what has been modified is the Argus sling is now a trans uh, obturator sling as well. The success rate, as was mentioned, is anywhere from about 20 to 80 percent, depending on the series that looked at. So uh, in terms of classifying trans obturator slings, they can be simple retrourethral slings, such as the advanced sling. They can be combined retrourethral and compressive. Uh, the atom sling is, is uh, uh, something like that, or the virtue sling is something like that, or they can be adjustable. Uh, the uh, um, uh, Argus is also an adjustable sling. So we have different types of slings and different classifications and combinations depending on what they do. And the outcome, if uh, one selects the patient on the basis of ideal factors for the retrourethral sling, you can broaden the, the factors for the adjustable or compressive slings uh, the outcomes are not bad. 
The artificial sphincter has been around in various formations since 1973. The last major modification was in 1985. And this is the standard approach. It's either a perineal plus a uh, lower abdominal or it's a transverse scrotal incision. Uh, there is some concern about the transverse scrotal incision. But overall, the success rate, and these are multiple series, are from anywhere from 60 to 90%. There are many series in the literature with very long-term follow-up, and the success rate is sort of similar. Uh, after radiation, there is a variably higher revision rate than without radiation. We do know there's a higher incidence of erosion and infection. Uh, after radiation, there's blood aerobactivity and bladder neck contractures, but the continence outcome after radiation with an artificial sphincter is quite similar to patients without radiation, but it's still a risk factor. We know that there are complications such as recurrent incontinence, erosion and infection, and rare urethral problems. We have algorithms in how to manage these complications, and these are dealt with surgically by and large, and the success rate is relatively good. The durability, uh, this is from Houston, at five years, 75% of men are free of complications. Uh, if they are revised, then usually they go back on the durability curve up to a point depending on how long they're followed. So there are a number of good options for men with uh, radical prostatectomy incontinence, slings from mild to moderate, AUS from moderate to severe. The failures can be managed surgically, but what we have now is an absence of level one evidence for any of the treatments that we uh, administer. Other complications are not as common, but these can be equally, if not more devastating. Uh, bladder neck contractures have been redefined as vesico-urethral anastomotic stenosis, uh, and they can occur following radical prostatectomy. They can occur fo following radiation as well. And the rate uh, after radical prostatectomy is anywhere from 1.3 to 27%. Most contemporary series are about 5 to 10%, and there seems to be a benefit after um, uh, robotic prostatectomy in that the rate of anastomotic stricture is lower. And there's a vari variable degree of association with stress urinary incontinence. It can occur after radiation, either external beam or brachytherapy from uh, two, uh, two to 12 percent. And uh, it, it gain can be quite devastating. In patients who've had a radical prostatectomy plus radiation, you can add up the complications and uh, it becomes even more difficult to handle. The algorithm is, uh, is uh, established, but the uh, nuances are not that straightforward. If the patient is continent uh, and it's a stricture, we do various modalities transurethrally in order to fix it. Uh, if the patient is uh, incontinent, then we can combine that with uh, urinary incontinence treatment. But most of the treatments or most of the uh, modalities are transurethral, uh, anywhere from laser incision to hot knife incision uh, to cold knife incision, to other uh, modalities. Uh, and uh, then uh, we get on to uh, if the patient has complete urethral obliteration to open urethral reconstruction, and we save diversion and uh, uh, other things for, uh, for uh, failures. The last complication I'd like to talk about is rectal urethral fistula, which is probably even uh, less in its occurrence. It occurs in less than 1% to 2% of patients. Uh, rectal injuries can occur intraoperatively, and obviously they should be fixed. Uh, occasionally, the anal sphincter can be dilated, and occasionally, if it's a severe injury, bowel diversion is done. Uh, risk factor for fistula or prior pelvic radiation, rectal surgery, and perhaps even TURP. This is an example of a fistula that occurs right from the anastomosis uh, into the rectum. As far as surgical repair, there are multiple repairs uh, described. The standard uh, repair uh, is a staged approach with, with or without fecal diversion, Foley catheter, uh, to permit the option of spontaneous healing. This can occur usually in patients who've not had radiation. Non-healing requires surgical repair. There can be a single stage repair depending on the health and comorbidities of the patient uh, also, uh, which can be considered. Uh, regarding the surgical approach, there can be perineal approach posterior approach, uh, transanal approach, uh, anterior approach, and, and uh, even uh, the rare endoscopic approach. And the success rate based on multiple case series is fairly high in terms of success. 
So the recommendations are that uh, if the fistula does not close with or without temporary uh, urinary or fecal diversion, surgical reconstruction may be done. Most patients, however, have temporary colostomy or ileostomy, but again, that's patient-directed or problem-directed, and not all of them do. Various techniques are available, and frequently this, had, this may be done in collaboration with colorectal surgeons. Occasionally, we run into a devastated urethra or a devastated bladder, and patients sometimes end up with uh, indwelling Foley catheters or suprapubic tubes, which uh, their lives are not pleasant uh, because one has to deal with the complications of this. One occasionally has to consider urinary diversion, incontinent or incontinent diversions. If we're factoring in fistulas uh, with the presence of stool, one has to consider uh, cystectomy plus minus bowel diversion for inoperable fistulas. If it's just bladder neck strictures or vesicoerethral anastomosis stenoses that cannot be operated on with or without radiation, then one has to look perhaps at bladder neck closure or urethral closures with continent stomas with or without uh, or, or diversions. Thank you very much.